Hello and welcome to today's Info Security Magazine webinar. My name is Dan Raywood. I'm the contributing editor of Info Security Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's event in association with Active Reach. Now, for the next hour, we're going to be looking at uh, lessons learned, or not, as the case may be, from the Dixon's car phone uh, breach um, from earlier this year. It certainly was reported across kind of the last 12 months. And, um, well, before I introduce you just a few, a few of today's panelists and a few housekeeping points, I just want to kind of read a little bit of a sort of a disclaimer, because, um, yeah, we Obviously, we're, we're doing something quite uh, quite unique here. We're actually picking up a particular case study. Now, just want to be kind of clear. We're not here to kind of say, hey, look at this one, that this is where they went wrong. Yeah, we are going to cover a wide range of data breaches. And, of course, it's actually quite good timing on, on our aspect that we actually were able to, to broadcast the same day, of course, that the Equifax uh, fine from the Information Commissioner's Office was announced. So what we are going to be doing today is looking at a bit of a general case of data breaches and how actually the common failings. But we are going to be looking at the Dixon's car phone breach as a bit of a case study and also just one little disclaimer we did actually invite the um uh the company dixon's car phone to actually participate uh, unfortunately they, they they weren't able to send anyone for this but i uh, just wanted to kind of make that clear before we start out so um you know we're not here with the pitchforks and the uh, you know and the fire we are here to kind of look at sort of some common failings around data breaches but we are going to pick on um sorry pick up i should say <laughs> pick up some uh, some pointers from that breach so just wanted to kind of make that clear before we push on and before we do uh, talk to about who we're going to be talking to a few housekeeping points um, so we are going to have some polls running throughout the hour so please do join in with those as and when they appear if you have any questions we are going to be taking questions later on from the um, from the audience so obviously you know if you have anything you want to ask then do let us know and we will obviously do our best to delegate those to the right person um, if you're on Twitter, it's hashtag InfoSecWebinar, as you can see at the bottom of your screen right there. We're on Twitter at InfoSecurityMag. And finally, if you're a member of ISC Squared, ISAC, or EC Council, you can claim one CPE credit based on a minimum attendance time of 60 minutes. That's one hour. Once you've done that, download your certificate from your InfoSecurity account, which sometimes take about 48 hours to be processed. So uh, kind of, you know, give it a little bit of time, especially if you're listening on demand. So without further ado, let's push on and introduce our guest speakers today. So delighted to be joined today by Max Pritchard, who is Senior Pre-Sales Consultant at Active Reach Limited, and also Helen Davenport, who's a Director at Gowling WLG. And I said, I'm Dan from Info Security Magazine. So a big thanks to both of those for uh, joining us today. And let's introduce our first poll question. So talking about data breaches, now, of course, you'll remember that uh, GDPR came in. We've done a little bit on data breaches here at Info Security since 25th of May. But question here, how long should a business wait before notifying the public about a breach? So should it be no waiting, immediate notification, even without detail, and update people later? Get, that, get the message out to the, uh, the, the people, the regulators. Uh, a day or two to get details straight, go with something. Maybe, you know, sort of give you a chance to actually get to know something. And uh, then you can go in saying, rather than saying, we've had a breach, say we had a breach and we think this happened. Or is it, is it C? Uh, within 72 hours, as per GDPR, as it, as it states, uh, not the public until details are clear. Get the regulator first, but again, with the full sort of 72-hour uh, time zone being used. Or as long as possible. And, you know, get, go with full details as much as you can. You know, 72 hours is just a guideline, isn't it? I'm going to check that later on with our legal expert, Helen. But um, do vote on that. Do let us know what you think of that. We're going to come back to that uh, later on. But delighted first to welcome our first speaker, who is Max Pritchard. He's Senior Pre-Sales Consultant at Active Reach Limited. Uh, so, Max, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, hi, everybody. My name's Max. Uh, thanks very much for joining me here. The Cyber attacks on Dixon's car phone in 2015 and 2018 were entirely predictable in form and in the fact that they were successful. They formed part of a decade-long trend in data networks of people's trust in business and public sector organizations being betrayed. Personal information has either been repurposed and abused or malicious actors and organized gangs have been able to waltz past traditional network defenses seemingly at will. In the face of decades of increasing investment in security teams and technology, our information systems are still proving to be vulnerable, perhaps increasingly so. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to go through the breaches at Dixon's car phone and try and identify what we can learn. So let's just remind ourselves of the timeline behind these data breaches. 
In May 2014, Carphone Warehouse and Dixon's Group merged to create a £3.7 billion retail giant, owning many brands and assets, bricks and mortar as well as online. Carphone Warehouse became a wholly owned subsidiary of Dixon's Carphone. As with any merger of this size, the company kicked off a raft of activities using internal teams and external consultants to realize the value of the merger. This included a complete review of their information security posture to identify any required remedial action. In June 2015, an external risk assessor identified a number of car phone divisions that take online payments and had weaker controls than other divisions and represented a higher risk of breach. Well done them, because the very next month, an unknown attacker started to probe some of the car phone warehouse's public web properties. The high-risk division websites included onestopphoneshop.com, e2save.com, and mobiles.co.uk. The attacker managed to find a way inside. For 15 whole days, the attacker operated inside the servers and network with impunity. Eventually, something was spotted the monitoring system, which resulted in the discovery of the breach and the affected websites being shut down. That was on Wednesday, the 5th of August. Three days later, on Saturday the 8th, Carphone Warehouse started to email customers assumed to be affected by the breach. The company issued a press release informing the public of a sophisticated cyber attack, which involved the apparent theft of 2.4 million customer records, which had to later be revised upwards to 3.48 million, which included the 1,000 employees, and details from 90,000 payment cards claimed at the time to be encrypted. Members of the public were furious and the press was scornful of the fact that the company had waited three whole days to inform people affected by the breach. Ten days after the breach was made public, shares in Dixon's car phone had lost 10% of their value, putting additional pressure on the retail business. So we fast forward two and a half years. On the 10th of January this year, the ICO fined car phone warehouse £400,000 nearly the maximum allowed under the Data Protection Act 98. I've seen online comments that if the same breach was prosecuted under the new 2018 Data Protection Act and the EU GDPR, the ICO would be able to assess a fine of up to £400 million. The ICO's monetary penalty notice, which is the formal public record of the fine being issued, should be required reading for board members and people in InfoSec alike. It contains a lot of technical detail which one may not expect from a document like this. It seems a shame that we cannot routinely see any analysis of breach mechanisms as part of the breach reporting regulations. We only know the details of the car phone breach because of the ICO's investigation, with reports from two security consultancies and submissions from car phone itself, which flesh out the story which we can learn from three years after the actual event. Anyway, I'll go through the detail in a moment. Three years on from the 2015 breach, six months after the fine in June this year, Dixon's car phone issued a press release announcing two more security incidents. One, an attempt to compromise 5.9 million payment card details from the retail network, which seems to have failed, and a separate successful one losing control of 1.2 million customer records. And at the end of July, they published worse news. Dixon's car phone issued another press release stating it appears that rather than 1.2 million, actually 10 million customer records were accessed. Investigations are ongoing into the 2018 incidents and there's a degree of unhelpful speculation. So rather than add to that, I'm gonna go through some of the findings from the breach in 2015. Firstly, the company's public statements were well prepared, but some phrases like taking the protection of customer data extremely seriously have slipped into cliche and can fly in the face of the evidence, becoming an irritant to upset customers. Carphone had many of the required information security policies in place. They had comprehensive patching policies, password, vulnerability assessments, and monitoring policies. Unfortunately, the policies were not adhered to across the board, particularly across divisions connected through acquisition, and any checks had not been effective at ensuring compliance. The servers compromised were scanned internally on the day of attack, but there hadn't been an external scan of the network for at least 12 months. The server software, like the web application and the WordPress content management system, 
were several years and many versions old and readily exploitable. Although the patch policy was fairly standard, the ICO described Carphone's approach to patch management as seriously inadequate. There are also major gaps in the tools used by the security teams to protect the web assets. There was no web application firewall in place, there was no anti-malware software on any of the servers, and multi-factor authentication was not employed for administration of key servers. Worryingly, all servers in the cluster had the same root password, which was shared between 30 to 40 members of staff. Hopefully I won't need to tell you why this might not be a good security idea. Once the attacker was on the servers itself, the following factors came into play. User credentials for databases stored on the servers were unencrypted. The attacker could use these credentials to query databases elsewhere in the system. The company didn't know it at the time, but the server was used as an archive for historic credit card data spanning five years left by a third party developer. These credit cards were encrypted as reported in the press release, but the encryption key was left on the server in plain text. It was actually the attacker making use of the server's CPU for decryption that triggered the monitoring system. And the servers were shut down 15 days after the initial breach occurred. While all of this is hard reading for the people responsible for car phone security and the data subject you trust them with their first formation, we're still missing the most important part of the breach story. The attacker's reconnaissance did involve a commonly used testing tool to scan for software vulnerabilities, and it found them. However, that wasn't how the attacker got in. Attackers do not use complex exploits if there's a cheaper way of succeeding in their goals. For all of the failures that the ICO cited in their monetary penalty notice, the breach in 2015 happened because a malicious external agent somehow got hold of an administrative password to a public-facing web application. No one seems sure how, social engineering perhaps, phishing, bribery, internal malicious act, or reused credentials being found elsewhere. But once the attacker had logged into a trusted device behind the customer's perimeter with admin privileges, it was all over. It partly explains why it took so long to detect the breach and the uncertainty about how much data the criminal exfiltrated. So my summary of the 2015 hack of Carphone Warehouse is this. The investigation found a woeful litany of underinvestment and a lack of basic security in one division of this multi-billion pound retailer. But this was not a failure of technology, nor is it uncommon for large networks to have technology backwaters, pockets of legacy equipment, or a lack of visibility of east-west traffic in the network. The network itself was built aligned to company business objectives where information security was not the priority, instead prioritizing growth and profit. The web prop properties were to enable the sales of services and products to customers with as little cost to the business as could be justified. That the system security was poor is almost incidental. The data was breached because of a failed trust model. In response to the size of the fine, the company complained that the information commissioner was imposing unjustifiably high standards of data security by reference to industry norms at the time, i.e. mid-2015. I note this phrase didn't make it into any of the press releases I've seen. We have to assume that this submission was a legal attempt to have the fine reduced rather than a serious expression of belief. Even in 2008, the security industry was offering the following evidence-based observations and advice. Simple security hygiene, such as knowing what data you are storing, keeping applications up to date, making sure policy is actually put into practice, and requiring more than a single password to administrate systems have been cornerstones of breach prevention efforts for more than a decade. By the way, these stats I'm using are for one of the principal annual sources of stats about breaches used by network security professionals, the excellent Verizon Data Breach Investigation Report, or DBIR. 2008 was the inaugural DBIR, which is now in its 11th edition. So let's bring the statistics up to date and have a quick look at the excerpts from the 2018 DBIR. 
that examined over 53,300 security incidents and 2,200 actual data breaches in 2017. So the principal cause of data breaches last year, according to this report, was stolen credentials, such as that used in the 2015 car phone hack. And if you were starting designing a network from scratch, you would look at dealing with that risk first, perhaps. RAM scrapers and web scrapers are used in attacks on retail point of sale devices and are designed specifically to extract payment card details. The statistics suggest that the attempt on millions of credit cards from Dixon's car phone in June this year was most likely an attack of this type. We can also see that DDoS attacks are the most common incident reported, although because they don't result in data breaches per se, they don't appear in the second table. Also notable is that human error and abuse of privileges are right up there with everything else. So statistically, we have a very strong awareness of how data is likely to leave our control. Cyber attacks are aimed broadly. Databases, point of sale devices and web applications are obvious attack points, but desktops are not far behind. We know that most criminals are looking for personal information, payment cards, medical records or credentials that can be sold on quickly. So we know what information the criminals find valuable, which may not be the same data that the business finds valuable. We also know that these are the nine recurring patterns of incidents and breaches that keep cropping up. Notable here is that the attack on web applications are not the most frequent, but seem to be proportionately the most successful. And the next most common cause of actual data loss are human errors, losing computing devices or documentation, or sending information to the wrong place or person. Just looking at timescales of the breach, Modern cyber attacks take minutes to breach perimeter defenses and exfiltration can start almost immediately, although massive undetected data exfiltration can take days or weeks. There isn't a lot of information to go on, but detection has lagged behind breach and exfiltration by several orders of magnitude and this deficit appears to be increasing every year. The upsetting thing is that by detecting the breach in just two weeks, Carphone beat the average by some margin. Taking a full three days before they alerted the public was far from ideal and upset a lot of their customers, but for many breaches, data subjects might be exposed to risks for weeks longer than that. Compare and contrast with the Equifax breach last year, which apart from using a software exploit to get in rather than an admin password, followed an almost identical path, what we would call a typical kill chain. The Equifax breach remained undetected for 76 days and involved the exfiltration of nearly 145 million customer records, 15 million from the UK. The report on the Equifax breach has just been made public by the US Government Accountability Office and like the ICO's findings at Dixon's car phone, is additional evidence if we really needed it of the fragility and ineffectiveness of the current security model being used to protect our data. So, 10 years and more of knowing how attacks happen, knowing what goes missing, who's involved, and still we're in a place where breaches happen all the time, almost irrespective of the size and capabilities of the companies involved. Even in 2008, there was a sense that traditional security controls were failing again and again in many of the same ways and it cried out for some kind of fundamental change in security thinking. Uh, the emphasis in this wall of text is mine. Uh, I'm not going to read it out. I'm sure once you have the recording you can pause it if you need to. The 2015 breach of car phone warehouses systems and probably the 2018 breach as well are part of an ongoing trend of failures to prevent security breaches. The common thread between them is not technological, but human in nature, and that thread is human trust. In 2010, John Kindervarg, a senior researcher from Forrester, published an idealized model security architecture built around a concept he called Zero Trust. There's a handy O'Reilly book if you want to have a read. Networks built to human design from human-made hardware and software components managed and used by humans for tasks of valuable human communication, our environments fundamentally underpinned 
and similarly easily undermined by failures of human trust. This isn't saying humans are untrustworthy, but rather that networks built on that human trust ironically lead us leads to us being unable to trust in the network or the data that flows around it. As the value of the data on the network grows, the need to secure the network increases. If today losing your identity or payment guard details is one thing, then tomorrow losing control of your autonomous vehicle is going to be quite another. Zero trust networks are designed to better protect a network from threats from external and internal actors not necessarily from those with nation state backing or resources. The Zero Trust architecture recognizes that sticking to perimeter security models like this one here that evolved in the 80s and 90s can only take us so far because remote working, mobile devices, cloud applications and infrastructure has made an incredible mess of the trust relationships between devices and between users. I showed this picture to one of my customers the other day and he went, yeah, that's more like my network is. It's not just a complicated puzzle to try and secure a sizable business network of this nature. It's a mathematically complex system, non-deterministic, unpredictable, and essentially unsolvable. In form, zero trust networks resemble the kind of covert communications network operated by the French resistance towards the end of the Second World War. A tight, highly segmented cell structure slow to recruit members, rigidly bound by protocol, and highly suspicious every member at all times. Each host is treated as if it was coming from the public internet and every application as confidential. Zero Trust Networks use many of the familiar security technologies we use in perimeter defenses, so firewalls and encryption, PKI, multi-factor use for authentication, but often employed in novel ways. A zero trust network temporarily whitelists behavior that meets a minimum level of confidence at that time, rather than trying to identify and block bad behavior. With the advent of tougher regulations, increasing value of data assets, growing complexity within business networks, and the continuing weakness of traditional security models, zero trust network design is finally gaining traction. A zero trust network is an ideal model, which looks very different when you apply it to different organizations. The model can be adopted as a strategy and then moved towards over a period of years, which means that reusing investment in existing security technologies is possible. Zero trust is not a single product or a service. It's a long time target design and a set of principles that when you follow them result in a very different looking network. Where do you start with zero trust networks? Well, there's the O'Reilly book, white papers and articles, and a public case study from Google called Beyond Core, which is their story of their five-year mission to re-architect their network security using zero trust principles. ActiveReach offers a very human consultancy service where we conduct a business and network audit and help companies build a target zero trust design and a migration plan, which can help move them towards a better security model. Some companies also prefer to look at a pilot, a proof of concept, taking a limited scope network function and building a zero trust platform around that. This, for example, is how we might em enable employee and third party access to your business applications in a zero trust manner. I'm more than happy to go through the scenario with companies after the presentation if you want more detail, but that, for me, I'm done. I'll be handing over to Helen now to talk about how best to work with the ICO post EU GDPR. Thanks for listening. Oh, I'm going to step back in there, Max. A big, thank, big thanks of you for, for your presentation today. So I'm just going to leave uh, Max's uh, details on there if you do want to uh, reach out to Max at all for uh, any more details, obviously, on Active Reach. And uh, that's his email, LinkedIn, Twitter, website, etc., and some of the sources. So a so big thanks to, to Max, actually, for kicking things off. I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, we are going to cover some, some more of the points later on that he made. I was particularly interested in, you know, he said, you know, the, the comment about uh, it was one part of the of the of Dixon's car phone that was that was affected. Uh, you know, that they, they managed to contain, contain the when when the breach happened between that sort of July and August down. So I think it's a matter of like 10, 11 days, something like that. And also the patch management issues. I mean, you know, some pretty common security basics. A, hate, a term I hate, Max. But, you know, self-security basics comes up quite a lot. Um, 
you know, do, do you agree with that sort of thing? It, it's these basics that seem to be still be the problem. I think Max might have gone on mute. I think. Okay. You coming back? Sorry, Dan. I lost connection there. Um, no. Yes, I, I do agree. I mean, we we see about maybe two thirds to eighty percent of the attacks would be solved using current controls and current perimeters if they were implemented correctly. But we've got to see a lot of the faults with security as being ones of accepting that we're human and that humans are going to make mistakes. Um, and so the way you design the network security architecture needs to take that into account. Um, yeah. Perfect. No, I agree with you. I think, yeah, I think it's, I think just seeing what we lack as an industry almost is sort of standards how you're supposed to do things like that. So I think that's, uh, that's something we're going to come to later on. So I'm going to say big thanks to Max for his opening presentation there. And we are going to launch our second poll question. So big thanks to all of you who voted in that first one. Um, I'll come back to the results in just a second. But we're looking at the second poll now. Uh, has your organization experienced firsthand any of the top reported breaches? So there we go. Um, so the options are use of stolen credentials, RAN scrapers, phishing, privilege abuse, or insider threat. Just let you know, we don't actually see. So uh, you know, the, all we see here is the numbers, which I'll, I'll re -back, repeat back to you. So do feel free to vote and uh, let us know. You know, if any of these you, you particularly have, have affected you, because we're always quite keen to know what kind of things. I'm not saying they're successful either. You know, <laughs> so someone tried to phish you, or someone tried to use stolen credentials to access your, you know, your cloud accounts or whatever. Uh, someone tried to, you know, have you, you spotted, have you caught insider abuse, uh, uh, insider threat in this case? So, you know, so do let us know. Like I said, we don't see who's actually doing what, but it's good to know what kind of threats you are typically facing. So we're going to, uh, just before we move on to Helen, actually, I just want to do cover the first um, results of that first poll. We asked how much of the business wait before notifying the public about a breach. 68% um, of you said within 72 hours as per GDPR. I kind of expected that. No one clicked as long as possible. 23% um, a day or two to get details straight. 8% no waiting to go straight to the regulator. So big thanks to all of you for commenting on that. Um, we did get the, um, I did get a question actually, it's quite a long one, but it did say uh, relating to GDPR and um, it says, uh, if you understand, there is, uh, if there is no likely risk or the risk has been removed by access to the controller, then you don't need to go public, is this the correct assessment? I'm actually going to, oh, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to it later on actually, because our next speaker introduced, a bit crackling on the line, he's Helen Davenport, who is director at Gowling WLG. So Helen, I am going to hand the slide deck over to you. Thanks very much, Dan. I don't think that crackling is, is me, but if anyone does have any um, problems with the audio, then of course let us know via the, um, the messaging. Um, so hi everyone. As, as Dan said, I'm a director at Gowling WLG. That's an international law firm. Um, I advise clients in relation to data breaches, cyber incidents and technology disputes. And as part of this, I advise clients on working with the regulator. Ultimately, uh, my role is to help clients minimize financial losses reputational damage and regulatory penalties. In the next 10 to 15 minutes, we'll cover what has changed since 25 May 2018, since the introduction to the GDPR, uh, notifi notifications to the supervisory authority, a very brief recap to put what follows in context, and then my top 10 tips for working with the regulator and finally, some other things to think about. So what has changed since 25 May 2018? Well, aside for, from much larger potential fines and other regulatory penalties, the other big headline from the GDPR was, of course, the introduction of mandatory breach reporting. So here I'm focusing on what that has meant in terms of actually what has been reported to the ICO since 25 May 2018. The ICO has confirmed that actually there hasn't been much change in the sectors reporting the greatest number of breaches. So the health sectors, education, government, general business, solicitors and barristers uh, remain the greatest reporters. Equally, not much change in terms of the common incident type types being reported. Uh, lost and stolen data and emails, faxes going to the wrong recipient um, remain common issues, and one in five of the incidents reported involve cyber incidents, nearly half of those uh, being phishing attacks. 
But what has changed significantly, not surprisingly perhaps, is the number of breaches being reported, suggesting that there were incidents prior to the GDPR that the regulator would have felt perhaps should have been reported to it under the old regime, but weren't. In terms of the actual numbers reported, in March, 398 notifications to the ICO. In April, 367 notifications to the ICO. And of course, those are before um, the GDPR came into effect. In May, there were 657. And of course, the GDPR came into force on 25th of May. So there were seven days at the end of the month when the new laws applied and there already seems to have been increased in the number of reports. And then in June, there were 1,792 reports. Now, I'm not aware that the ICO has confirmed such precise figures for the months following June, but it has said it continues to handle around 500 reports per week, so perhaps even a slight increase again. And of course, we've continued to see the further examples in the media. So the Dixon's car phone example from June, then there were others in July, there's Butlins, and even more recently, of course, VA. What we haven't had yet are examples of regulatory action, as the ICO no doubt continues to investigate the breaches reported to it. And of course, some of the breaches that are being reported may still be breaches under the 1998 Act, even if they were notified post-25 May. So even if we do get news of those penalties, that may well not be as instructive from a GDPR perspective anyway. What is clear is that the prospects of an organisation having to notify a breach and having to work with the regulator are much greater than ever before. And that's what I'm going to focus on in the remainder of my session. So a quick recap regarding notification to the regulator. The definition of a personal data breach is of course a wide one. It covers a breach of security leading to the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of, or access to personal data. Where such a personal data breach arises, the notification obligation is on the data controller. And as we touched on in the opening question, the controller has to notify the regulator without undue delay, and if feasible, within 72 hours after having become aware of the breach, unless it's unlikely to result in a risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals. If 72 hours isn't feasible, then the data controller must provide a reasons justification. However, that I would suggest is territory you don't want to be in, and that data controllers should assume a reasonably high threshold. For completeness, I note that the breach reporting obligation on processors is, of course, to report the breach without undue delay to the data controller. So when does that all-important 72 hours start from? What does awareness mean? Well, the Article 29 Working Party Guidance says, a data controller is aware when it has a reasonable degree of certainty that a security incident has occurred that has led to personal data being compromised. The Article 29 Working Party Guidance goes on to acknowledge that a data controller might initially not be sure whether a breach has, has occurred or not, and it states that a data controller can have a short period of time after having been informed of or detecting an incident to investigate it. And during that time, it won't be considered to be aware, and the clock, the 72 hours, won't be running. However, the objective of that first investigation must be to establish awareness, whether a breach has occurred. So, for example, if a controller de detects a possible intrusion into its network, it knows there's been a security incident, but it doesn't know if personal data has been affected. At that point in time, it wouldn't be considered to be aware, and it can investigate further, but when investigating, its objective should be to establish if personal data has been compromised in that incident. Contrast that with a third party contacting the controller saying that they have personal data belonging to it and providing evidence, maybe a copy of the data, an extract of the data, or some other evidence from which the data controller has a reasonable degree of certainty that a personal data breach has occurred there can be no doubt at that point that the controller is aware for the purposes of the GDPR and the 72 hours is running. 
So what needs to be notified to the regulator? Well, at least all of these things. A description of the nature of the personal data breach, where possible the categories and the number of data subjects affected, and also the categories and the number of data records. Name and contact details of the data protection officer or another contact. Description of the likely consequences of the personal data breach and also a description of the measures taken or proposed to be taken and measures taken to mitigate any possible adverse effects. Now that's of course extensive, especially in the context of needing to report in 72 hours. The information can be provided in phases. Uh, the laws contemplate that, but as we'll come on to, that doesn't mean it's automatically okay to file an incomplete report. So, as I said, I would come on to my top 10 tips for working with the regulator, and these are based on my experience, and I've also factored in the feedback that the ICO has provided in forums such as its webinar and in its recent speeches since the GDPR came into effect. I should say not all are recommendations of in favour of one approach over another. Personal data breaches need to be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, and what I'm about to say is certainly not specific to Dixon's car phone, but hopefully it should provide you with some useful points to bear in mind. So point number one, begin the initial investigation as soon as possible. If you think a security incident may have arisen, if you don't, then following the Article 29 guidance I mentioned, the ICO may find you were aware or should have been aware that a personal data breach had occurred and then you could be out of time when you come to notify. Regulatory action can, of course, be taken for failure to comply with notification obligations for 72 hours. The next two contain the breach and assessing the risk are priorities within the 72-hour period. This is so you, and particularly the latter, assessing the rights and freedoms of individuals is so that you respond appropriately and also determine whether the breach should be notified. I'm not going to go over the assessment of risk, as this isn't the purpose of this session, save to say that, again, that Working Party 29 guidance emphasises the importance of considering the likelihood of risk as well as the severity of risk, and it also sets out factors to consider. The key point for present purposes is that whilst you can ask the ICO for a view when you go to no notify it, and we'll come on to the ways in which you might do that next, you want to demonstrate you're in control of the incident as much as possible at the start and being on top of your own position in terms of having contained the breach and also having assessed the risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals can only help that. So as I said, um, coming on to notification, there, there are a number of um, or options in terms of notifying. You can use the ICO's telephone hotline, the number is on its website, or you can also use its online form, which again is available um, from a page on its website as well. Now this, this decision is very much one where it depends on your circumstances. Uh, the ICO is positively encouraging use of the helpline, especially for organisations reporting for the first time who may not be familiar with the process. And the ICO is also saying that about a third of the data breaches that are being reported to it at the moment can be resolved by way of the first call which, of course, if that, if that can be done, that helps the ICO as there is no need for the follow-up correspondence that would be necessary if those had been reported online. However, if you do report by telephone, you should assume that it will be treated and recorded as a formal report. There isn't such a thing as an initial informal conversation, so you should be prepared. And I would recommend still preparing answers to all the questions on the online form, even if you're going to report by telephone. It will assist the call be as efficient as possible. And again, it also demonstrates you managing the situation. The telephone hotline is also not available all of the time. So if you need to report out of hours, and the 72 hours deadline, of course, includes evenings, weekends, bank holidays, you will need to report online. And there may be other factors that you want to consider. If you go down the online route, and this is my fifth point, should you use the online form, or what about using your own form that perhaps you might have prepared uh, as part of your 
uh, incident uh, response plan activities to collate certain information. Well, there's no prescribed format, so the use of your own form is permitted. Uh, but I would recommend using the ICO's form if possible, as it's the form that the ICO is familiar with. It will also help you demonstrate that you've answered all of the questions and also what information you can't provide. You can always add a covering letter or supporting documents if there's something else you want to say outside the form, or you consider that will support your position. A factor that the ICO will take into account in any regulatory action is cooperation with it. So I would recommend being as helpful as possible, and it might be a relatively small thing, but actually using their form um, is a way of doing that. On to point six, uh, cautious approach versus the over-reporting. Well, given the potential penalties for not reporting, there is some sense in erring on the side of caution when assessing whether or not to report a breach. However, the ICO has flagged that one of the trends it is seeing is over-reporting, and it warns against this, particularly as organisations become more familiar with the new laws going forward. Particular issues to avoid, I would say, a serial over-reporting and also jumping the gun when it comes to lost documents or devices that may realistically be found within the 72 hours. My next point is avoid busy periods. And this is relevant if you're reporting by telephone or seeking other advice. The ICO has openly acknowledged that there are times when its phone lines are busy, especially Friday afternoons. So the key is to plan ahead. If you may be reporting a breach late on a Friday, it would be unwise to assume that the ICO's availability will coincide with yours and enable you to wrap things up nicely before the weekend. Better in those circumstances to be prepared to file online, I would suggest. Phased reporting versus incomplete reports. As I said earlier, the guidance contemplates phased reporting, but that should not be used as an excuse to make incomplete reports, which is another trend the ICO has raised. And in my, my expectation is that over time, I think the ICO is likely to start clamping down on this, especially where the data breach that is being reported is significant you should provide what detail you can when you report. Especially if you can't provide all of the required information or you have indicated your investigations are ongoing and you will provide an update once those investigations have been completed. My ninth recommendation is to anticipate next steps. When you communicate with the ICO, indicate when you intend to provide that update to try and manage the situation and, if possible, to avoid the ICO giving you a deadline that actually doesn't fit in with your planned out investigations. And my final point is to achieve all of the other things I've talked about. You really need to be prepared. You really need a robust breach plan and you need to be able to deploy it swiftly and call on the expertise of key stakeholders, the people involved from IT, legal, your communications team, and your data protection officer, if you have one, to be able to work with the regulator effectively. So that's my top 10 on working with the regulator. There's, of course, more I could say, but I'm conscious of the time. And it's, of course, important to note that in terms of breach response, notif notification to the regulator is just one aspect of that response. And so my final slide includes just some other points to consider that, of course, is there might need to be communication to the data subject. There may be other issues to consider if the breach affects data subjects in other jurisdictions. There may be others to notify, industry regulators and the police. The obligation under the GDPR of the controller to keep documentation of all breaches uh, for record keeping and accountability. There may, of course, be notification obli obligations under other legal instruments. Here we're just talking about the GDPR. And there are other things to consider in relation to breach response as you go through the phases of immediate response, investigation, remediation, and evaluation aspects. Thank you.
All right, Helen, big thanks to you for your presentation today. And we are going to come to some questions in just a moment. As you may expect, we've had quite a lot of questions, not just about sort of uh, Dixon's car phone, but also about GDPR um, reporting as well. So we are going to come to those in just a moment. But uh, yeah, a few thanks to Helen from um, Galling WLG for presenting with us today. So before we move on, just a couple of talking points. Uh, we're going to launch our third and final poll. So we'll stop the second poll right now. Thanks to all of you for voting in that. We asked, has your organization experienced firsthand any of the top reported breaches? Thanks to the person who did say none of the above. Um, yeah, uh, I decided not to put none of the above, but um, obviously I kind of figured if, if you, none of them affected you, then you just wouldn't vote. But 66% um, of you said phishing. That's pretty standard. We've all had phishing messages, 17% use of stolen credentials and then very small numbers eight for eight percent inside the threat six percent privilege abuse only one percent for ram scrapers so huge thanks to all of you for voting in that one and we're going to launch that one you can see on your screens right now and ask which parts of your network do you perceive to be most vulnerable to attack is it databases or servers uh point of sale terminals or point of uh communication terminals if you're not working in retail obviously you know you have a Various places of iPads now and all these kind of things, um, you know, IoT devices, should we call it that, um, spaced around their um, their businesses. Uh, web apps, you know, it can be all sorts of web apps, be it cloud, be it uh, hybrid, internal, whatever. Which we sort of bunch them into the same kind of category there. Um, desktops or another. And if you have clicked on another, then please do let us know. We're going to try and get through as many of the questions as we can in the next uh, just over 12 minutes or so that we've got left of this webinar. So that one is going to remain open. And we're going to just, just before we take some audience questions then, we're going to um, ask it, you know, just take one more look at the Dixon's car phone um, uh, breach that, you know, was the headline of this particular webinar. Max, I'll, I'll just bring you back in first because I'm just going to kind of run through some of the points you made. I know we've, we've kind of covered the thing about the patching element because you you pointed out the ICO um, said the approach to patch management, match, patch management excuse me, was described as seriously inadequate. Uh, no firewall in place or no WAF in place, no anti-mail on the servers, no multi-factor authentication, um, and all these kind of things. I mean, you know, that, that breach investigation finding slide, and by the way, if you do want to download Max's slide deck, they are in the attachments. Um, you know, Max, it, do, it does seem here, like we, like we talked about just before, you know, it does seem a lot of these things but are kind of pretty standard. But then, would you, like I say, would you imagine that to be a, a common thing across a lot of businesses, that they all sort of see these things and think, yeah, oh, we, we're not doing that either, and sort of, sort of keep, you know, <laughs> hand on the, on the wood that we, it hasn't affected us yet? Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, I mean, there, it's a hierarchy of risks, isn't it? And you're looking at each business, and each business is different in terms of uh, the tools that it uses in its IT infrastructure, um, and how each of them relates to the personal information that it may be processing under GDPR, and the other sensitive data that it might have, you know, their business secrets and um, intelligent, uh, you know, intellectual property. So whether a particular security control is uh, you know, an absolute howler if they miss it out could well come down to a proper risk assessment and an understanding of how much it would cost to put that control in place compared to how much it would cost the organization if that particular piece of information or that asset was to get stolen or be erased or otherwise tampered with. Um, so everything has to be placed in context. And uh, the nature of the GDPR is that the technical response is just one of a, 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 a small fraction of the overall attitude that businesses have to take to their networks when they are taking responsibility for handling personal information, which isn't theirs. So if you look at the response Equifax, for example, uh, this is a credit control agency whose customers were businesses and governmental organizations um, looking for information on consumers. Um, and so the data uh, on those consumers um, was sitting in Equifax's systems, often without the data subject themselves being aware of the fact, um, let alone having a voice at the table when it came to deciding where the investments in security should be um, and how the processes, how diligent the company should be in, in following their own processes. So it's all about balance and proportionality. Um, but the problem that we're seeing is that the company responses to that is often a bit misguided um, because of human, very human attitudes 
um, in business decision making to risk and a difficulty in articulating um, risk of technology failure uh, compared to human error um, when you're designing IT infrastructures. So, and I think these are these are going to be common, and they have been common for decades. It's not a new problem; um, it's a very human problem. Yeah, and I think actually, um, I'm just looking at the. Um, we actually ran the story today on on Info Security about the. Uh, Equifax, uh, Equifax breach. Um, sorry, uh, Equifax fine. I should say. I'm used to saying those two words together, aren't I? Equifax breach. Yeah. Um, the um, and um, yeah, the one one in our story today. It said was widely criticised at the time for failing to patch a known Apache struts vulnerability for several months. Uh, once again, it, it, it's these kind of like I mentioned before, these kind of basics. Uh, you know, the issues of what's actually been what hasn't been done and what led to it i mean you know as we know attackers are pretty savvy they use scanning tools that are able to find these vulnerabilities and unpatched vulnerabilities that are actually then able to be exploited whether it be zero days whether it be just be through password management as per um or you know stolen credentials as per our last poll result but um we just uh, we did have a, a couple with some really good questions actually um and this one, I'm, it's more of a comment than a question, but it did say that the Dixon's breach seemed particularly, particularly egregious. I can't even pronounce that word. Egregious. Egregious, egregious yes. Um, did Dixon's do a complete security audit of Carphone as part of its acquisition risk, risk management process? Again, we did invite uh, Dixon's Carphone to participate. Um, I don't know if they would have answered that. Anyway, Max, I can't answer that. I don't know if you can either, really. I would have thought so, but uh, difficult yeah, I mean, one as to part, As part with. of any merger or acquisition, due diligence is, um, is performed. Forms, whether whether a company whose core business is not information security um, can do an effective audit of their information security posture across their estate um, is is unclear. Particularly with modern businesses being hugely complicated um, in terms of IT assets and, and public facing um, web assets, some organisations we work with have not just tens of thousands but hundreds of thousands of connection points to the public networks um, and. The first problem is trying to get visibility on what is connected to what and where. Um, even before you start to look at vulnerabilities, it's just finding where the data is, where the devices are, where the people are that are using them. Um, and as companies grow and get bigger into multi-billion pounds, multinational organizations, it's no surprise really that things go missing. Um, in Even if the audit's done very thoroughly, no being very, very simple, but otherwise potentially very damaging. Yeah, and another comment we had just about um, Carphone or Dixon's Carphone was it was due to access credentials falling into the wrong hands, and yet the ICO listed the other security weaknesses in the review and appeared to find incorporating those other vulnerabilities which were not exploited in this case. Is that to be expected? Um, Max, just just yeah, we'll just stick with you before we move to hell. I'm just with some of the more yeah. GDPR questions we've had. Um, I guess yeah, that, that makes sense. Is it is it fair that even though, like for example, those anti malware, the WAF, the uh, multi factor MFA, those weren't causes of the breach. Maybe MFA could have prevented it, and actually all those things could have prevented it. Is it fair that the fine was issued despite those things that not being the cause? Well, I can't speak of fairness particularly, but. I yeah, think the sure. law is rel the law is relatively clear under GDPR and the Data Protection Act. It's uh, down to a company to be able to demonstrate that the security that they have put in place um, has due regard to the state of the art uh, and is um, effective at doing what it says it should do. Um, so, if a company is not testing their security environment. Um, and can't demonstrate that to a regulator, the regulator is going to have to take it into account when they're assessing um, whether to um, put a fine in place and how much that fine might be. Um, because it's not that that control failed, it's that the lack of that control um, was something that um, would be a concern and that the company couldn't demonstrate that it's taken the, the risks associated with those vulnerabilities um, appropriately. Yeah, fantastic. We're just going to push push on and we and um, talk to Helen then. So we have a, a ton of cool uh, of questions about regulation, ICA, GDPR, etc. Um, this is a really one I liked actually, Helen. Um, and I don't know if you if you know the answer to this. Did the ICO take anonymous whistleblower calls? Uh, <laughs> sounds a bit like Crime Stoppers to me. But do do you know the answer to that one? Uh, from I haven't made one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> neither have I. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, clearly anybody can call the, the number that's on the website. Um, and I am aware of occasions where, for example, data subjects have been concerned about something that's happened and they've reported that to the ICO and that has prompted activity. If it yeah. is, what I would say is if it's an anonymous call, um, that may impact on the weight to which the regulator, I'm not, I'm not saying that they would ignore it, but that may um, impact on the weight that they would give that particular issue. Yeah. I mean, it, it, who knows? I mean, I think I think the question, yeah, if you did ask that question, I think maybe is to contact the ISO and actually ask them. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. But a question I did like, Helen, which which I'm just going to perform. We're coming right up on time here. But um, the person did ask, in this regulatory model, do regulators provide guidance for deciding whether or not a breach is unlikely to result in harm? Um, I guess that the situation here is this obviously did uh, the, the Dixon's car phone situation did affect a, num a small number, and then it turns out it was a larger number. Ditto uh, Equifax and Fox with a large number in, in total. But are regulators providing guidance to determine if, if a breach? I mean, I guess the wider question could be, you know, is it kind of do they then determine the harm based on the fine they're going to give? So um, maybe if I take that in stages. Um, yeah. So the so the first point is, is there guidance around uh, assessing risk? And there is guidance both in the recitals to the GDPR and in the Article um, 29 Working Party guidance, uh, which, I, which I mentioned earlier in, in the session, I didn't go into detail. So for example, um, that says at one point, you know, where, where the breach involves personal data that reveals racial or ethnic origin, political opinion, religion or philosophical beliefs, and some other examples, such, you know, a, a risk should be considered likely to occur. So, th so that's the sort of guidance that organisations should be applying um, when they're considering whether, to, whether or not to notify first the regulator and second data subjects. I wonder if perhaps we could put a link to that guidance in with the materials. Um, yeah, uh, we can add that but, afterwards, definitely. Yeah, definitely. If you send that to me, um, that afterwards, the, yeah. And the second point is, is that then taken into account in terms of um, the, the regulatory action? And, and again, the, the answer to that is yes. So whether, whether um, what's happened is would be likely to have distressed individuals will impact on the fine or other action that's taken and in um, the Equifax um, fine that's come out today uh, in the press release, that, that's one of the things that's said is that the breach um, would, have, would have caused distress. And I think that's been a factor in, in the fine that's been imposed. Yeah, and, and the, the effect upon the victims, as it were, you know, the, the people who were tied up in that breach, that, that, that's, that's the determination of whether they issue a fine in the first place and then the size of the fine, is that right? It is it's certainly a factor, and from the um, the, sort of the principle of um, data protection laws, the the focus is on the data subject. They are they're the most important individuals in in all of this. Yeah, I'm just going to just squeeze one quick one before we run out of time, Helen. Just because you mentioned the working part, 29 uh, Article 29 Working Party. Um, someone did ask: uh, are American are American um, social media companies, or American based social media companies? Um, bound to the Article 29 uh, Working Party requirements as as, uh, as as European companies. I'm trying to work out the question as I ask it. Um, yes. Are American companies bound to the, the Article 29 wo um, uh, reporting requirements as European companies are? Is that is that make sense? It, it does. So, that, so the first question, so the first part of the question is: I mean, does does the GDPR apply to them at all? Um, and the GDPR applies to um, controllers or processors that even if they're not in the EU where their processing activities are related to offering goods or services uh, to data subjects in the EU or where they're monitoring individuals in the EU. So there is a potential for um, organisations in other jurisdictions to be caught. In terms of then whether that Working Party 29 guidance applies, um, it it isn't it isn't part of the GDPR, so it's not in that sense um, legally binding, but it carries weight because it's um, contributed to by the ICO and equivalent organisations in the other jurisdictions. So for the purpose of the GDPR, um, it is important. Great. 
and GDPR applies to all, whether you're a retailer or a data processor or whatever. So, well, with that, we are going to wrap things up. Um, big thanks to all of you for your questions today. We've had some absolutely fantastic engagement today, and um, we are going to join. I've just read a poll question still running, so I better stop that before we um, before we wrap up. Someone did actually say the other, um, which parts of the network do you perceive to be most vulnerable to attack? Somebody say other as people. That was only nine percent though. Forty nine percent said web apps. Twenty one percent databases. Nineteen percent desktop. No one said point of sale terminals. Which is interesting because when those could be, uh, I certainly know in some restaurants they now use tablets and stuff like that. So, uh, but big thanks to all of you uh, for voting not just on that poll but throughout the polls throughout, and of course for your attendance today on the webinar. I hope we were able to uh, give you some some learning points about data breaches generally, and obviously also the case study of um, of Dixon's car phone, obviously the, the Equifax as we heard about um, earlier today. Um, so again, uh, also a big thanks today to our sponsor, Active Reach, and our two speakers, Max Richard and Helen Davenport. Um, if you're interested in more webinars, we have another one coming up in two hours, actually. That's 6 o'clock UK. That will be 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, how to secure the four corners of modern IT. We're looking at the differences between securing uh, bare metal and the data center, cloud containers, and virtualization. So the four different levels and what those different uh, consistency, what, what the differences are among there. So we've got some, a couple of great speakers on that as well so do join us I'll be moderating that one as well and also uh, all of our old webinars including all of the sessions from our recent online summit are available on the website that's www.infosecurity-magazine.com um, and also there'll be a recording of this webinar available very soon so you'll be able to listen to it all over again and um, please do rate the webinar before you leave us let us know what you liked and obviously if you'd like to hear anything else in future that we haven't covered or other things you'd like to talk about we can do that obviously always good to get your uh, your uh, feedback on that so with that big thanks to all of you for joining our three speak our two speakers today and uh, active reach our sponsor and we'll see you